I've switched back to using a headset, by the way, because I've become aware that this very fancy microphone that Complexity Explorer got for me to record this course with is doing a very good job of picking up the HVAC system in my office as well as the wind outside my office window. Okay, back to work. Your ODE solver is stepping along, figuring out where the ball will go next on the landscape. As you saw in the previous segments, ODE solvers make mistakes. Forward Euler, for example, will overshoot when there's a step down in the landscape. The mathematics behind that is the Taylor series. You remember those? There are notes on the supplemental materials page of the course if you don't. A Taylor series lets you approximate what a function looks like near a known point. Let's say we have some function f of x, and we know its height at some value, x0. And we want to know its height a little bit over to the left or a little bit over to the right, delta x away. Taylor series lets us approximate the height of the function at that value. Here's the formula. For the nth term, the pattern looks like this. And forward Euler is essentially the first two terms in that series. And that actually gives us a way to estimate the size of the error that forward Euler makes. To first approximation, it's the next term in the series, the first one we didn't use, this one. That way of estimating error, which is common in the field of numerical computing, rests on two implicit assumptions. First of all, that if you use the full series out to an infinite number of terms, the answer would be 100% right. The second assumption is that successive terms in the series are smaller. Those assumptions are generally, but not always, true. This kind of error I'll call the truncation error, the error that comes when you're doing a series approximation to something and there are some terms that you don't use. There are other kinds of error, too. For example, the quantization that's implicit in floating-point arithmetic, where you lose some digits. If you try to enter this number into a calculator that only carries three places to the right of the decimal, for instance, what that calculator will store is either 1.837 if it rounds or 1.836 if it chops. That kind of error, which also turns up a lot in sensor measurements, I will call round-off error. Now here's an important distinction. If an ODE solver makes an error in one step, that wrong value will get used as the starting point for the next step, so errors can actually snowball. Imagine if the marble is a little bit to the left of the horse's spine. If the ODE solver messes up and moves it just across the spine, then on the next step, that marble will react to the slope there. Now, if your sensor that you're using to observe a system makes an error in displaying the value of the angle of a pendulum or something like that, that error does not get coupled back into the dynamics. I will call that observational error. That's the stuff on your glasses. And the former, the stuff that gets coupled back into the dynamics, I will call dynamical error. All of this stuff will come back later in this unit. Now, let's look more closely at that error term that I derived for the forward Euler method. The form of this term suggests that the error that forward Euler makes will depend on the curvature of the landscape. Again, this is what's called the local truncation error. This is for a single step of the method. That's this term here. And that's not surprising if you think about it, because forward Euler does a linear extrapolation along the tangent vector f prime. This term also suggests that the error is proportional to the square of the length of the step you take. That's that part of the term. We call this an order h squared error, or an order delta x squared error. I won't talk too much about this big O notation. It's a computer science notation that tells you how the complexity or the memory use of your algorithm scales as the parameters in your algorithm change. In this case, the error is proportional to the square of the step size. And that's implicit in the term to the left as well. Now, remember backward Euler. It's an implicit solver. Loosely speaking, that means that it does some sort of prediction and then sort of some sort of correction. That helps it do a bit better in the step-down situation that causes such problems for forward Euler, but it still isn't perfect. Remember how it turned the undamped simple harmonic oscillator's ellipse into an inward spiral? So it too has error. I'm not going to do the derivation, but it's also order h squared. This picture may give you an idea. What about averaging the two? That is, taking the slope used to take the forward Euler step and the slope used to take the backward Euler step and averaging them, and then using that slope to move forwards. That's called the trapezoidal method, and it does better than either forward or backward Euler. What do you think its truncation error is? 
it's actually order h cubed because it essentially is using another term in the series. And that's better because h is small, so h cubed is smaller than h squared. All those derivations, by the way, are uh, what are called local truncation error. That's for one step of the method. Global truncation error for lots of steps is different. There's also a different way to calculate truncation error that gives you a result order h for forward and backward Euler and order h squared for trapezoidal. I'm not going to go into that one either. Okay, so all of these solvers make errors that depend on step size and the geometry of the landscape. Now, think about a landscape like this. What step size to use? You need a small step size in here to get the answer right, but you don't want to use that small of a step size out here because that would be overkill. On the other hand, a step size that's appropriate out here, great big one, would give you a very bad answer in this part of the landscape. The solution is obvious. You should use different size time steps in the different regions. But remember that you don't actually know the landscape when you set out to solve an ODE. That's exactly the answer that you're trying to find. And what that means is that you have to figure out as you go along whether or not the step size you're using is okay. And that's what adaptive time step ODE solvers do. By the way, you can also imagine adapting the order of the method using a better method in the wigglier regions and a less good and less work method in the smoother regions. I'll talk about that in the next segment. Okay, how to do this. Remember, all you have is the current point and a way to evaluate the slope of the function at any given point. That's the system derivative. One common approach in this situation is to take a step that's h long and then to take two half steps and see if both of those operations land you close to the same place. In this picture here, the blue arrow shows the operation of taking a step with some solver from the starting point with a step size of h. The green arrows are the operation of taking first one and then a second step with the same solver from the same starting point using a step size that's half as big. And then what you do is you look at this spacing. And if that spacing is less than some tolerance specified by the user, then what that means is that the h-step was good enough. If the situation looks like this instead, the distance between the place where you go with the h-step and the place where you go with two h over two steps is very big, then that h was bad. If you saw this situation on the right, you should probably have the h and then loop like this. As I've written it, this loop will successively reduce the step size until it's good enough as measured by that tolerance. Now, clearly there's extra work here, but that work is necessary to know if your answer is good enough. There's another potential issue here. If you specify a tiny, tiny tolerance, this algorithm, as written, might reduce the time step to the point where you get bitten by numerical effects. Recall, computers don't do well with tiny numbers. We'll get back to that later in this unit. Okay, what's missing here? This loop will handle the transition into the wiggly region, that is, it will take care of reducing the time step if it needs to, but it has no way of increasing the time step here, where a small time step is overkill and you can get away with a bigger one. So let's fix the pseudocode to take care of that. There's extra work here too, but it's worth it because using a bigger time step saves work in the long run. There are ways to streamline this particular algorithm and be smart about reusing information. And there are lots and lots and lots of other algorithms for adapting the time step or other solver parameters or even the solver method itself in order to move efficiently and correctly along a complex dynamical landscape. These include some truly sneaky ways to leverage knowledge about the error, like that forward Euler error term, in order to back out the exact time step that will satisfy your error tolerance. Many of the production ODE solvers that I'll talk about later in this unit use these kinds of strategies. But this discussion, I hope, should give you the basic ideas.